If at first you don't succeed, well, you know the rest. That's this week on Motoring 2003. SN's Motoring 2003 is brought to you by Quaker State Motor Oil, oils fine-tuned for different engines, and Midas, total car care, we do that. It was just a few years ago when Honda introduced the Insight, a gasoline electric hybrid. Lightweight and fuel efficient, the Insight was Honda's answer to reducing air pollution. Personally, I love the design, but a few people were prepared to shell out $25,000 for this two-seat coupe, and the Insight was not a success. Well, Honda is back with a Honda Civic sedan equipped with the same hybrid system. So will this popular vehicle entice people to buy? Well, time will tell. Well, we now have the Honda Civic Hybrid in our long-term fleet. And over the weeks to come, we're going to check out this vehicle and point out the highs and the lows of a system that Honda believes will set the standard for future vehicles. And, you know, speaking of the future, Chrysler recently invited out some auto journalists to check out its version of what we may be driving on the highways of tomorrow. One thing that uh, I think most Canadians really enjoy are cars. And what they probably enjoy more, and it shows up at the auto shows, are the concepts. Like, what's the future hold for vehicles? What are they going to look like? What kind of powertrains are they going to have? So we have nine concepts here, ten concepts to be exact, and uh, had a chance not only to look at them and to hear about them, but to actually drive them. It gives everybody a feel for where we're going with our brands and where we're going with our products. And we're getting that feel for what people think about those products. Well, they're so unique that most of them are a one of a kind. There may be a couple of some. And they're worth well over a million dollars each. And, uh, and some more, uh, some almost two million each. To actually drive these vehicles worth a million bucks or more each, what a thrill. I mean, even just looking at them gives you a rush to actually get behind the wheel to touch them and then fire them up. What a great sound. Several will go into production, uh, starting with, of course, the Chrysler Pacifica, which will be built at the Windsor Assembly Plant starting in uh, late January, early February 2003. Important, important launch for us here in Canada. Secondly, the Chrysler Crossfire, which will go in production early next year as well, uh, to be built in Germany, but have a Chrysler badge on it. The Chrysler PT Cruiser Convertible will go into production as a 2000 in 2004. Uh, and the NIA, I'm the uh, Dodge SRT4, uh, which will also go in production. A, a, a fun rocket uh, small car that we think is going to attract a lot of uh, a lot of youth. The other products are in terms of evaluation right now. The M80, the the Razor, the Willys, the Compass, are all vehicles that we've got positive response to. We just get a feel now for whether we should pursue it a little further. Sometimes you may not see the full concept go into production, but certain parts of it will. Uh, the engine out of the Jeep Jeepster, for instance, ended up in the Grand Cherokee. Uh, and sometimes it may be certain elements of it. And then you look at the crossfire and you say, wow, that, how can they put that in production? Then they blow your mind away by actually doing it. I like the M80. I think it's really neat. It's, uh, it, it really addresses uh, a, a vehicle that is missing in that segment, uh, which is an entry-level pickup truck that, that does it all. Uh, as we like to say, it goes from snow to surf. Uh, it has a lot of uh, capabilities. It reflects the Dodge brand 100%. We, we kind of uh, liken it to a son of power wagon. It's really neat. I, I mean, I'm 37 years old. I'm not what this market is targeted for, but I would buy one in a heartbeat. And that's why you make concepts is so that you can get some reaction to because if you just go ahead blindly and say I'm gonna make myself a new vehicle and don't listen to people then you end up with a Pontiac Aztec that nobody wants. 
on the interior uh, end of things. I think you're going to see more breakthrough designs on in the interiors. Uh, we're we're finding out, you know, more and more people spend a lot more time inside their vehicles. And that's the part you really live with when you think about it. There's emotion there that you've got to like how it looks first. Design is just such an exciting business. There's so many different directions you can go. Uh, Daimler Chrysler, I think, has done uh, more in the line of bringing its concept vehicles to life than uh, virtually anybody else. Uh, so it's really... Uh, what you're seeing here is a little bit of uh, what's down the road. Now, Bill Gardner says new technology is great as long as somebody else owns it or he gets to fix it. More later on Kenzie's Corner. It takes precisely 16 seconds to transform this gorgeous coupe into a road-ripping roadster. And you know what? From a driver's perspective, you basically just sit here with your thumb on a button and the whole lot folds down into the back without any assistance or aggravation. As soon as the deck lid shuts, we're now ready for this week's test drive. The item that impresses about the SL500 is not so much its flashy looks, but more the level of technology packed beneath its sensuous lines. Take the engine for example. The 5 liter V8 pumps out 302 horsepower and 339 pounds feet of torque anywhere between 2700 and 4250 RPM. Enough to blast the SL500 to 100 km an hour in 6.5 seconds. Needless to say, there is never a lack of go when the driver tromps on the gas. Find behind the wheel of the SL and you'll find the opulence the price tag suggests you should find. First of all, the nav system, for instance, it actually works whilst you're driving down the road. Naturally, however, it's the passenger that's playing with it. You also get a good radio, a hookup for your telephone, and these climate controls, well, they're either fully automatic or manual. The seats themselves fully articulated, heated and cooled, and when combined with the tilt and telescopic feature on this steering wheel, the driver can find the perfect driving position. On the subject of safety, well this thing comes with five airbags, one in each of the doors, one for the passenger, one for the driver, and a fifth down here. Now this one is a knee bolster airbag which prevents you from kneecapping yourself when you T-bone somebody. Then you get to these two things. Now believe it or not, these are supposed to be the coffee cup holders. Just shows you how low a priority they are in Europe. Leave them folded away. There is a third, however, and it sits here. Now as well as successfully peeing off your passenger by dribbling coffee down their leg, it drives the driver to distraction. When you go left, it smacks here. You go right, it bangs off there. When you brake, it's there. And when you accelerate, it's there. Take the bloody thing and throw it away! From the engine, the power is relayed to the rear wheels through an electronically controlled five-speed automatic transmission that features two shift settings and the ability to change gears manually. It really does work wonderfully well. Now, for you eagle-eyed viewers, you'll notice that this is not the car we started the test drive with. Rather, we've traded in the SL500 in favor of this SL55. Now, along with a host of AMG upgrades, a much larger and better set of brakes to boot, it's this sign on the side fender that tells you everything you need to know. Beneath the hood, a 5.5 liter V8 that's supercharged. That means 469 horsepower and an incredible 516 pounds feet of torque. It really does make, to state the obvious, a tremendous difference in performance. However, that performance does come at a premium because this SL55 is a cool $40,000 more than the SL500. The power and ability to switch gears through a pair of steering wheel mounted buttons makes the SL55 feel more sophisticated. It also drops the time needed to reach 100 km an hour down to a bewildering 4.7 seconds. It really does transform a good car into a really great one. Now with only 8 cubic feet of cargo capacity with the roof down, you can't put much into this car. And that shows up 
there's not even enough room for my little overnight bag. However, Mercedes-Benz addressed that. When you get off your chopper, you simply push a button, the whole lot lifts up. Now, so you don't damage the top, the trunk lid won't come down until you lower the lock back. And now you're ready for that exotic getaway. Both models use Mercedes-Benz active body control suspension, meaning better handling and a comfortable ride. ABC achieves this by regulating the hydraulically controlled servo cylinders that are incorporated with the shock absorbers and coil springs in the suspension struts. Practically, it delivers a plush ride that is devoid of body roll. This brings outstanding handling as was witnessed through the pylons. The brake system on this SL, well, it's more than a little different, primarily because it's brake by wire. Now, what that means is there's no physical connection between the brake pedal and the brake system itself. Rather, a computer controls the brakes based upon the information you feed it through the pedal. Now, as well as controlling all normal brake function, it also looks after the anti-lock, the traction control, the electronic stability control package, as well as the panic assist. Now, this thing, when you nail the brake pedal, it applies maximum brake effort. The whole package really is the best way of controlling the system and is certainly the way of the future. However, for you worry warts, well, don't panic, because if there is a catastrophic failure, either power or computer, the system reverts back to a normal hydraulic brake system. For the record, I recorded stopping distances of just 102 feet from ADK with the SL55. The SL500 adds about three feet to the space needed. That aside, the systems work exactly as advertised and that is exceptionally well. So there you have it, two cars for the price of one test drive and two very different cars at that. The one thing they've got in common, with the top up, you've got the comfort of a coupe. With the top down, you've got one really racy roadster. Now as for the two cars, you can think of the SL500 as being the automotive equivalent of a kid glove. As for this SL55, well it's got the same kid glove exterior, but beneath, well it's got one big set of brass knuckles. Our Midas Tip of the Week concerns gear selector positions with an automatic transmission. Via email, we've been asked a couple of questions lately about this. First question was, how about with an automatic transmission during city driving, should I defeat the overdrive and run it in drive or leave it in overdrive? Well, by leaving the transmission in overdrive, you realize all the fuel-saving benefits of an overdrive transmission, the benefits that are inherent with that type of transmission. In other words, the vehicle will quickly shift up at the earliest possible point into overdrive, thereby reducing engine RPM and maximizing fuel economy. The downside to this, however, is that vehicle speed picks up very rapidly, and it's also you, don't, you also don't get the deceleration that you're looking for when you lift out of the throttle. So by defeating overdrive or just keeping it in drive, you'll find the vehicle much more controllable. You'll be able to hold to the road speeds posted around the city much more easily. And when you lift off the throttle, that vehicle will want to slow down. The second question was, should we shift an automatic transmission into neutral when sitting at a long traffic light? Well, the idea there would be to cool the transmission down, but in terms of driving, the last thing you want to do is have a vehicle that's not ready to go at an intersection. So in all cases, don't shift it out of drive and into neutral at a, at a traffic light. Leave it in gear so that you're ready to react at a split second for safety's sake. That's your Midas tip of the week. It's a 1945 Divco. Uh, it was made in Detroit. It's the Detroit Industrial Vehicle Company. That's what Divco stands for. Uh, they were pr primarily made for the dairy industry, but they were used for inner city delivery of everything. Meat, beer, paper, uh, you name it. It was used, anything that was a work truck, it was used. Unfortunately, there's not a lot of them around now because they weighed 6,300 pounds, so when scrap was high, 
They were the first thing that went to the scrap yard. It's a unibody construction. Uh, it's a Toronado front wheel drive. After that, it's uh, dual rails going down to a single uh, arm suspension. It's in the rear that drops to the ground. It's got a 383 Chev engine on it. And unfortunately, putting the 383 on it, there wasn't enough room for the starter and the oil pump. So one had to go. I couldn't see myself going out there and hand cranking it. So it's got a dry sump system in it, um, distributorless ignition. Uh, it's just a kind of an unusual put together of half racing stuff, half road stuff. It's a da everyday, daily work truck for me. It's great because when you go to a customer's house, they never forget who you are. It's the best advertisement you can do. The gentleman that built it races cars. So he made everything easy to work on and incredibly quick, which is good. The new Honda Civic Hybrid comes equipped with a continuously variable transmission, or CVT. Kind of looks like a big, heavy-duty bicycle chain. But simply put, it's a gearless transmission, and Audis and Saturns come equipped with them. And as you'll see on an upcoming program, it's standard on the new Nissan Murano. Now, it's not new technology, but I'm sure there are some people who kind of question the reliability. Will they end up with high repair bills? And is it a risk? Well, let's put that question to our man in the Quaker State Garage, Bill Gardner. Well, Brad, Subaru had a CVT transmission quite a few model years ago in one of their vehicles, and I didn't hear of any problems with those. But you know, one thing that we all know about Honda, when it comes to powertrain, once they bring something to market, believe me, they are not using you and I as their proving grounds. They've ironed out any glitches that was in that design. So I certainly wouldn't have any problem with buying one of those. Um, We've got some email we want to answer this week from one of our viewers, his name's Doug, and he asks, what can you tell me about engine knock slash ping? I have a 96 Ford Crown Vic and it seems to be knocking quite noticeably under load. It's mostly noticeable on level ground when accelerating. Uh, he says he's tried higher octane fuels and that helps, but he has to use uh, 93 octane to get rid of most of the noise and he says at some time uh, the noise is so pronounced that the thing sounds like a diesel. Well, Doug, what I can tell you is that the fact that you've upped the octane and it has helped to some extent means that you're somewhat on the right track. I think you've probably got a carbon problem in that engine, so I'd suggest you take the vehicle in and ask the mechanics, ask the repair shop to decarbonize the engine. They'll run the engine on a concentrated cleaner that flushes the fuel injectors and also has a secondary effect of decarbonizing the entire combustion chamber. There's one other area where carbon could be a real problem in your engine, and that's the EGR valve, the exhaust gas recirculation valve. Uh, the plumbing to those valves and the valves themselves tend to clog up with carbon, especially on an older model vehicle like this. It's not at all uncommon to find that EGR completely blocked with carbon to the point where it's no longer functional. Now the engine will run without EGR flow, without exhaust gas recirculation, but it will be extremely intolerant of low octane fuel. It's going to ping like crazy under load on low octane fuel and this is exactly the complaint. And we do get a lot of email uh, about problems just, just like this one. So have it decarbonized and verify, ask the mechanic to verify that there is not only EGR valve opening, but EGR flow. Now if the EGR is plugged, the car will certainly fail an exhaust emissions test. So there's another uh, valuable input that you could use. Have, an, have uh, an emission test done it as well. But get it decarbonized, check the EGR flow, and I think you'll find that once you correct those problems, you'll be able to go back down to mid-octane or low-octane fuel, and you'll get rid of the knock and ping. And this applies to a lot of other vehicles other than just our viewers' Crown Vic. Till next week, I'm Bill Gardner for Motoring 2003. Now just because I occasionally drive my lovely old AMC Hornet, isn't she a beautiful thing? Some people think I'm anti-technology, that I'm a Luddite. Well, it's not true. I mean, I got a cell phone, I've got a Sony Vio laptop computer, I even have a digital camera. As the surfers would say, I'm hanging 10 on the edge of technology. But when it comes to automotive technology, I admit sometimes I'm a bit skeptical. Take the current hybrid craze, the gasoline electric powertrains. Well, I recently drove the Honda Civic Hybrid. As a piece of technology, it's great. Works fine, except for the electronic dashboard, you'd never know you were in anything but a conventional Civic. 
And if you don't tell your neighbors, they'll never know. But this thing costs $8,000 more than a comparable regular Civic. And based on the fuel you're going to save, it'll pay for itself in 28 years. 28 years. Now, Honda builds good cars, but 28 years? Now, people say that the cost will drop as more people use it. But with a 28-year payout, who but a dedicated tree hugger is even going to try something like that? But even from a technology perspective, there was a display at the Tokyo Motor Show a few years ago on the Honda stand, which really put hybrids into perspective. It was a zero emissions gasoline engine. Now think about that. Zero emissions from a regular gasoline engine. Why are we worried about hybrids? Now Honda doesn't have one in production yet, but Nissan does. They've got a Sentra for sale in California that actually pollutes less on a 10 mile there and back commute than a conventional car does parked in the driveway. That's impressive. Now, we can't get that car in Canada because our gasoline is so dirty that those advanced systems won't work and our government won't get off its butt and do something about it, but that's a subject for another rant. Now, long term, the answer has to be hydrogen, whether we use it as a fuel in a combustion engine like BMW is working on, or whether we use it to power fuel cells like everybody else is working on, that's still to be decided. Medium term, the answer is diesel. Now, there are a few regulatory and emissions issues to work over, but almost overnight, we can improve the fuel consumption of our fleet by about 20% by switching to diesel. Hybrids, not going to happen. Electrics, they're not even in a frame. They didn't work in 1915. They don't work now. Ford has pulled the Think Car project because nobody wanted to buy it. So until we get hydrogen, I think I'll stick with my Hornet. I'm Jim Kenson. Before we go, I just want to remind you of our Car of the Year special that is quickly approaching, and we'd like you to vote on our selections. So check out our webpage at motoringtv.com or click in tsn.ca and vote on our nominees in each segment. And on a future program, I'm going to announce sort of a grand prize, which I think can be best described as a once-in-a-lifetime experience. Make sure you join us for that as we continue to bring you more stories about cars and the people who drive. Although we're running a front-wheel drive V6 platform, uh, it is the fastest car out there and uh, the handling capabilities are second to none. TSN's Motoring 2003 has been brought to you by Quaker State Motor Oil, oils fine-tuned for different engines, and Midas, Total Car Care, we do that.